And we're back for another episode of Start a Puzzle, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. If you want to start, own, or build a business, then you're in the right place. We bring you the real truth about what it's like to take something from concept to launch. From growth, innovation, experience, failing, or winning big, we've got you covered. So let's get down to business with another episode of Start a Puzzle, brought to you by Fullscale.io. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Sufjan Manir. He'll be sitting in for Matt Watson today. Now, before I get too far into this episode, I do need to let you know that today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. What we're going to talk about today is a very important topic. And why is it important? Because kids are going back to school or possibly going back to school in the midst of a pandemic. So if we only had some smart school technology to help with some of that, life could be a little easier. Well, what do you know? I just happen to have the CEO and founder of One Screen here once again, Sufjan Manir. Welcome to Startup Hustle. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and this is this is a hot topic. So for those of you that don't know, and and you definitely don't know yet, I have a three and a half year old and a five and a half year old, and who we're here in Kansas City, and the big debate is: Are our kids going back to school in a month? And what are some of the things that can help us know where they're at and what they're doing? And I, I'm really impressed with what you guys do. Now, for those of you listening, you know I like it when you're interactive. So go to onescreensolutions.com, or you can just scroll down and click the link in the show notes, and you can see all the cool stuff that one screen does why we talk about it but let's go ahead and get started with with a little bit of your backstory so what what is your story what brought you to to this point in our timeline now so um we used to be a reseller of audiovisual technologies and other educational products uh, did that for a few years and um, you know in the process we were realizing that there were some big gaps in the industry um you know schools uh, teachers, um, they wanted uh, technology that was really easy to use and could improve the learning environment uh, in their classrooms and in their schools. And a lot of solutions that we were selling were um, siloed solutions that were only solving pieces of the puzzle, right? And what ended up happening was teachers had to use 10 different products from 10 different vendors uh, to deliver a basic lecture in the classroom. So we thought it's really important to make it really easy for teachers to use the technology so they can focus on the students and not on the technology that's allowing them to deliver effective lectures. And um, so we decided uh, to come up with this product called OneScreen, which is a complete turnkey solution. It's hardware, it's software, it's cloud services, and it's backed by our Screen Skills Guru support, which provides training and capacity building to the teachers. the teachers can literally put just one product in the classroom and it gives them all the tools and technology that's needed to better engage with their students. Um, So that's the product that we launched in 2012. And then over the last seven, eight years, of course, it has enhanced a lot. We have added more uh, tools in our toolkit, but the idea remains the same. How do we deliver a turnkey smart school solution that basically makes it easier for the students to to learn better in the schools well that that's an ambitious undertaking you know most of the time when we have startup founders on startup hustle they are not doing hardware software and cloud Um, those can all three by themselves be a, a, a a massive challenge and learning process to overtake now in the in the fr- uh, words of many many people that are in the hardware industry hardware is hard uh, and then trying to get it to connect to other stuff is a challenge as well i mean it, it has that has dealing with all three that that three-headed animal of hardware software and cloud been been a challenge 
um, it has been a big challenge, but we don't see any other way around it, right? Unless you deliver a complete turnkey solution to the teacher, if the hardware is coming from a different company and they're using third-party software and somebody else's cloud, it just doesn't give them that uh, ease of use and, and the freedom to reach out to one person for any type of support on the technology. Right, so it is an ambitious undertaking, but we felt that that is really the only answer um, for uh, that the teachers had been looking for. Right, and uh, it has been a challenging road, but we have been on this journey for eight years, and in the process, I think we have really streamlined our processes, where you know all of these things are now working together very well, and we are able to to, to deliver on that promise. And you mentioned that you guys launched this in 2012, correct? Correct. Yeah. What? Why that? Do, while that doesn't seem like a long time ago, and startup years, that's an eternity. Um, <laughs> so with that, you know, in 20, I look back at 2012, and you know, I was in, I was in a completely different business, and uh, I mean, it was like the tech, tech, and the and the, just the web in general was still had a, a wild west quality about them. Um, bandwidth wasn't what it is now. Like, you know, here in Kansas City, we have Google Fiber and that's a gigabit line up and down. And we were the first city in the U.S. to have that. And we were excited and entrepreneurs were excited. And a lot of people moved here to be able to be on the, the first receiving end of that gigabit signal that would do some things like the solution. Like you guys have, uh, I love that it says your one screen hype here, but talking about web-based video conferencing and collaboration software. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't a, that wasn't a practical reality for most locations in 2012, was it? I I think it wasn't even practical until like six months ago, because one of the challenges we had with schools was they were saying, you know, distance learning, it's not, you know, it's not important for us, right? Right. And we were, we were I, I mean, I mean, from like a true technological standpoint, though, like you didn't even ha- in 2012, like I saw Skype for the first time in 2009. Yeah. And yeah. even as cutting edge as that was at the time that it was hard to find bandwidth to support it, depending on where you were talking to. So, you know, schools and especially public schools aren't always on the cutting edge of of receiving stuff. So, I mean, was that, was that one of the very first challenges was just even connectivity? That, that has been an ongoing challenge and it's, it's improving very rapidly. And, you know, one of the things that uh, you just mentioned about Kansas city, we have been a direct beneficiary of it because with the Kansas city public schools, we have one of our nation's largest deployment done in Kansas Hmm. city. And having that sort of internet uh, infrastructure on the back end definitely, you know, facilitates um, our product positioning. What was the relationship that Kansas City had with Google Fiber part of that relationship? Was that part of why that that came to be, or was that just was that just? No, I think the Kansas City Public Schools is it's a very progressive uh, school, and they wanted the best technology out there, and I think. Uh, what ended up happening was they invited us and many other companies on kind of like a showdown where we had to go and all the teachers walked in and and they had to pick the best technology that uh, you know would solve their problems and and they eventually ended up picking one screen so so we became the de facto uh, technology for Kansas City Public Schools. Well, that's cool. And and thanks for bringing that to our kids. That's neat stuff. Um, you know, some of the things, and like I mentioned that, you know, I think we, we often look at 2020 and man, what a crazy year. We'll talk about that in a second, but you know, we, we don't, we take so much of the things and the, the connectivity and the accessibility and especially bandwidth, uh, for granted. Cause you know, like we said, when Google fiber, that was the first, we were the first city that had that gigabit connection. And some of the things that, that people were racing for, they were talking about like telehealth and telemedicine and the ability to be able to have a high resolution screen and stuff like that. And, you know, the, and then, you know, another thing with schools is, is, you know, they're all over the place. Some of them are well-funded, some of them are not. Uh, But one thing that we have found is that all public schools now have some kind of screen they have like a monitor or something in, in the room. And is, I mean, do you find that that's the case as well? 
Correct. It's, I mean, uh, many of them still have the projectors, but almost every school is now going in the direction of the screens, replacing the old projectors with the interactive displays. That has kind of become the de facto, um, you know, tool uh, in the classroom that the teachers use. Um, and, uh, and you're absolutely right. I mean, they're all types of school districts, you know, all over the nation, and they have different budgets and different needs. And what we are trying to do here is cater to all of those customers. So one of the programs we have launched is our subscription plan, where we give our complete technology, including the hardware, as a monthly subscription package and no upfront cost, right? And that has been started to become very popular because you know, schools are only paying for the technology when they need it and don't have to, you know, make uh, heavy upfront capital investments to get this technology. So it's one thing to provide software or hardware or solutions to <clears throat> anyone. It's another thing to actually implement the solution. What kind of a challenge has that been? Because, you know, and, and God bless our teachers uh, and all that they do, but many of them would be the first to tell you that they're not quote technologists. So what, what kind of a challenge have you, what do you guys do to, to make sure that, you know, cause it, without proper onboarding and setup and execution, you're going to end up with a bunch of hardware sitting there collecting dust. So what, what did you guys learn throughout that process? Correct. So, so that is the biggest hurdle in, in, um, you know, delivering any technology, especially in the school settings. And I think there were two key components that we needed to address it. One was to have um, the right reseller partners um, who could go in and not only install the screens, but provide the initial um, trainings and you know, connect with their IT systems and make sure that our technology is working seamlessly in the school's environment. So that has been an ongoing process, and we now have over 180 resellers throughout the U.S., and all of them have been you know, uh, qualified and certified by OneScreen. Uh, so we have a fairly strong on-the-ground presence through our reseller network. And then the other component that we have developed is our centralized tech support teams, which we call our Screen Skills Guru Team, which is accessible to the teachers on-demand, real-time, um, anytime they need. And so we are fielding more than 100 calls every single day where like some teacher will click on a button on our screen and it will instantly connect them to our tech support team via a video call or an audio call or live chat. And we conduct like these five minute impromptu uh, training sessions where the teacher will say, I want to use this tool in my next class. Can you just give me a quick rundown? And what we have found is that is the best way for uh, the capacity building uh, of the teachers, right? Where we are constantly available to them to train them as they need training versus just, you know, uh, doing, uh, you know, annual uh, training sessions or anything like that. So between the reseller channel and our screen skills guru team, I feel like we have, we have uh, you know, uh, done a really good job at solving um, the key problem, the key hurdle. That the teacher yeah, and I would I would imagine that that was I would imagine that was a pretty important part of everything because you know if you're out there and you're trying to build a startup that does anything uh, if pe people get frustrated quickly and if you have a problem especially if you're standing in front of a room full of people and something's not working you don't have time to fill you're not going to fill out a support ticket and you're only going to need to do that so many times before people are just going to quit using everything that you do was that was that the was that the reason that you had to have that instantaneous support? Exactly. And I think it worked the other way around. I mean, that was the biggest problem that we wanted to address, making it easy for teachers to use technology. Support was the key component. And then having the hardware and the software technology that's easy to use and our support understood very well is what you know made us realize that we need to have our own hardware and software platform. And our confidence level in our solution now is what's allowing us to offer this on a monthly subscription plan where, you know, if a school gets this technology from us and a year later they don't want to use it anymore and they cancel the subscription, the, you know, the financial responsibility is on us because we have made the investment in installing the hardware for them and we have to take it back. 
So now we are at a level where we feel confident that once we put the technology there and with the support that we are providing, it is going to benefit the teachers and, and our solution is, is they're not canceling the subscription on us. So over the last few months, we've had a couple episodes, uh, one of which we did back-to-back -back days that had winners and losers of the pandemic. And I mean, as a society, we're all losing, but as biz as businesses, uh, these things ebb and flow, like where when market conditions change, one business will benefit, another one might not. I would have to think that your that your dem the demand for what you guys do is probably skyrocketing. Is that correct? Yeah, so yeah, I mean, I think you can put us in the winners category there. Uh, you know, the obviously there have been challenges with the pandemic uh, internally. You know, managing um, uh, the operations remotely as well as a lot of schools, a lot of customers just you know shut down, and the customers weren't really there to use our technology anymore. The hardware sales on the interactive displays were going down, but at the same time, our one screen high distance and blended learning platform, uh, you know, the subscription skyrocketed on it because, you know, every, every school out there was looking for a distance learning solution. And in the meantime, we were able to repurpose a lot of technology that we had developed um, over the years into this new product that we have just launched called One Screen uh, Go Safe, right? And this is basically a, a body temperature and face mask detector, which a lot of schools are now installing at the entrances. Um, you know, because this, as the students come back in, it's really important that you know they're taking the temperature measurements, making sure you know they're keeping the schools safe. So with the new product, of course, you know the uh, the sales have skyrocketed um, as well uh, over the last couple of months. So. So overall, I mean, from a business perspective, um, you know, we are in pretty strong shape right now. So you guys, you guys do a heck of a lot of stuff. Is all the hardware, is that all proprietary stuff that you've built or have you partnered with other uh, hardware manufacturers to, to get this stuff out to market? No, so that's what's kind of unique about us is, is we are taking responsibility of, um, every component that we are building from the scratch. So on the hardware side, our strongest partner is Qualcomm that's in our backyard. And we have a very, very strong partnership with them where we're using their processes. But from their processor, we go all the way to building the screen. So it's our own motherboard. And then we have some ODM partners in China who are designing and manufacturing the screens for us. But in every product that we are launching, you know, uh, we are utilizing the Qualcomm technology, which is pretty much the greatest technology available in this industry today, and building our own motherboards, our own software from the scratch uh, to deliver very unique solutions to the market. Yeah, and that's always a challenging decision with anyone that deals with hardware. Now, before I before I owned my own business, I used to work for a, a company, uh, a Japanese company, Roland, and they the, they were the world's largest maker of electronic musical instruments, and they make one hundred percent of everything that they make. And the reason is, is so they have that level of control. And it also has a lot to do with support. And some people don't realize when it comes to hardware, you have little transistors, chips, and stuff like that. And if someone stops making them and you don't have them in stock, you might not be able to support your own hardware. So it was that part of the decision but behind taking some control over making motherboards and stuff like that? The, the main reason we went in that direction was because we felt that you know, the industry was lagging behind in a big way, right? I mean, just to give you an idea, many of our competitors are still using these large interactive displays that run Android 7 or in some, in some cases Android 6 operating systems with like low-end Chinese processors, 2 GB RAM, a lot less power than what you get on your cell phone. And we felt it's almost a crime to give a 65 or 75 inch screen to a teacher and expect them to run all the educational tools on that screen and you know the the processor running that screen does not have enough power that they get on their cell phone right so so we decided to take the matters in our own hand and we went to Qualcomm and we uh, you know um, uh, 
uh, got them on board and we now have the the fastest and the most robust interactive displays in the market that that's running on the latest Qualcomm Snapdragon technology has more RAM runs on Android 9 uh, so it's 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 uh, you know there was a, almost a four year gap if you look at the tablets and cell phones uh, technology versus what the interactive displays were offering and we have uh, you know, bridge that gap by taking control of of developing our own hardware. And that that sounds like a huge undertaking. I want to talk in a second about how you plan for all that. But once again, with us today, we have the CEO and founder of One Screen. Sufyan Manir. Now, if you go to onescreensolutions.com, you can learn more about what they do. While you're on the internet, stop by fullscale.io and learn how we can help you build a software team quickly and affordably. Now, any your I, you know, I, I want to talk about how you planned for all this. And I, I have a smirk on my face because I'm sitting here thinking, man, this had to require a lot of planning. You have hardware, you have software, you have some proprietary things, some third party things. You have a reseller network. You have to teach. You have to support. Uh, you have to do a whole lot of improve, update and upgrade. So uh, how much time and effort have gone into just general planning at your company over the last eight years? I mean, it just never ends, right? It's a constant. <laughs> we, we are in the that's, why, that's why I had the look on my face. I mean, it's probably <laughs> overwhelming. Yeah, it, it is. But we are blessed with, um, you know, with a really good team and some very strong partners. Um, that have been very loyal to us, uh, you know, over the last eight years. So, so it's, I mean, we are looking at about, in terms of like building the technology, I think we are about, you know, somewhere between 300 to 400,000 man hours of, uh, you know, software and hardware development uh, that has gone into this product. And that's just our own team that doesn't include Qualcomm and Conta and some of our other technology partners that have helped us along the way. Um, so it it has been a very big undertaking, and the idea was never that you know um, you will be able to fulfill this promise within a year or two years. We knew going into it that this is a very big undertaking and may take you know anywhere from five to ten years to get to the point where we are actually delivering um, on this promise. But um, but uh, yeah, I mean uh, some planning, mostly luck, I guess you know. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not a big I'm not a big believer in luck. <laughs> it's preparation and opportunity crossing paths. Now, it, you talk about hundreds of thousands of hours of planning. Now, during that process, there was probably a lot of trial and error. Are you able to share a story where you had planned for something and it certainly did not even come close? So that has happened a few times, but I think what happens is then we go back to the drawing board and see, you know, what what can we do with with. So we, for example, we we built this technology for our interactive displays, right, uh, to remotely manage um, these displays from a central location, and we thought that was a really big. Uh, it was a fairly big undertaking, and we thought that's going to be a big selling point for us. When we will go to the school districts and tell their IT teams that, you know, from a central location, you can manage all those devices, you can do firmware updates, you can lock them down, you can, you know. Um, so a lot of time and money went into that product. And when we launched it, we were not getting, you know, the kind of re response we had expected. And, you know, that product in itself was, was kind of a loss leader for us for a while until, you know, we decided to launch a completely different product, this one screen go safe, um, where we were able to repurpose the same technology that we had built for our large screens and incorporate it into this product. But for this product, the same technology was very useful. And the response that we got from the customers was that was our number one selling point, right, for the product. So, so there have been a lot of ups and downs, just like any entrepreneurial journey, right? But the key is we try to make sure we, uh, you know, we are a nimble, small company. And so we want to make sure that every um, project that we initiate and every resource that we have, we maximize the the ROI on those projects. So sometimes we have to 
just reinvent ourselves, right? If if uh, the the original plan doesn't work out for us. So you mentioned that you have a reseller network that spans. Did you say 180 different resellers, or was that markets? Resellers, resellers okay. in the U.S. market. So let's talk about that for a second, because I think a lot of people don't understand, might not understand the importance of that network. Because if you go with the reseller network, um, if they don't sell stuff, that's a problem. Um, I mean, obviously now at the same time, those are often, uh, performance-based agreements. So they have a vested interest in selling more stuff, but what were a few things that you, can you, can you describe or give us a couple uh, comments about the process of uh, successfully setting up a seller, a reseller network and like what some of the hassles are with that as well? Yeah. So that probably is the is the process that takes the longest um, in terms of, you know, as, as you're trying to scale the company, because if you're trying to go and sell direct, you can, uh, you know, you can grow very rapidly, but I, I think there's a certain scale beyond which it becomes very difficult uh, to grow, right? So, so the biggest challenge with the resellers initially is, you know, they don't know you, you're an unknown brand, you're some, you know, new kid on the block and they they prefer the big brand names, right, that uh, they want to represent. So up front, it's a lot of, um, uh, you know, heavy lifting to to go and convince them to partner with you and, and put their skin in the game and, and, you know, learn your product and start selling it. Um, and and we had to go through that many years of cycle where we had like very few like good strong loyal resellers in different parts of the countries, which was limiting our uh, you know our scalability. But I think it's 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 something that you know over time it just keeps getting easier and easier, right? Because when you create those success stories, when the brand name gets a little bit better, a lot more companies are willing to. Um, come and partner with you and then the other challenge happens and that's the challenge we are facing now is you don't want to have too many resellers in the same region because then they are competing with each other and you know they're not loyal to you again because they think you're not loyal to them so so that's kind of the position where we are in now where we are where we are very selective in adding more partners and we really want to focus on our existing channel and and make them successful um and so we are making it, you know, the criteria to become a reseller is is a lot harder now than what it used to be a couple of years ago when we didn't have resellers. But the key is to focus on the right partners that share the same vision with us, right? Who are not box movers, who are not like, I mean, they basically look at it as solution selling and focusing on the education market and are willing to sell the hardware, the software, the cloud services, the complete turnkey solution. And there are not too many resellers out there who have this capability. So, so, so that has been does, yeah. does yeah. your company do you do and do you do the marketing and like and raising the awareness of your brand and stuff like that? Or is that done through resellers and you help them with that? I mean, how do you, how do you get this product? How did you get your product to market or how do you now? So it's a joint effort, right? I mean, we do whatever we can uh, with the limited resources we have. Some of our technology pro- uh, partners like Qualcomm, some of the bigger companies, they're a big help in, in helping us, uh, you know, create um, the market awareness. But of course, a lot of heavy lifting is done by the resellers who in their areas are going out there, showing our product. It's a, our technology has to be shown to be sold, right? Nobody is just going to go to Amazon and, and buy this online, right? So a lot of it has to be done by giving product demos. And we have our own inside sales team that's doing these demos all day long for our resellers uh, online virtually. And then we have a lot of resellers, you know, with feet on the street who are going out there and, and showing this product to uh, you know, one customer at a time. And, and that's how we are going the business. So, so if one of your resellers wants to do an advanced demonstration of your, of your hardware or software or anything, then you actually have a team of people that assist with that. Correct. Correct. We have an insight. Oh, that, team. 
you just go to onescreencamera.com. We use our own technology where you know the people can see us doing a live demo on the product, and it's an interactive video call basically through which we are doing a lot of these demos. Yeah. And for those of you listening, if you have to get your sales message out, that can get messy in a hurry. Um, you know, you, while you might be an expert on your product, you could even provide all of the support materials and everything. It doesn't mean anyone's going to read them or pay attention. So um, you sometimes hear the phrase control the narrative. Um, if you have to, you know, and that, and that's the thing is, is I would imagine that your resellers sell other products that aren't one screen as well. And so trying to find them, hoping that their salespeople are any good at what they do and hoping that they know anything about your product, especially when it comes to answering questions. Cause you can get a demo down and I can pretty much guarantee you that whoever you give it to is if you're not well versed at the product, they're probably going to ask you a question you don't know the answer to. And the more times you say, I don't know, or let me get back to you or I'm unsure, or you're just wrong. It just pretty much destroys confidence in what you're selling. Cause the person you're giving the demonstration to looks at you and they're like, well, shouldn't you know something about this? Aren't you the one that sells it? They don't understand the relationship of the reseller and stuff like that. So I think that's a smart approach, man. I really like the way you guys have set this up. And, and you know, if you have anything that you're selling, you know, basically a reseller network, you can almost think about that as a fran your own franchise. You know, you're franchising your own stuff through other people. What I like about that approach as well is, like I mentioned before, is that's a usually a performance-based thing. So if you have to put your, you know, great salespeople, well, first off, they know they're great salespeople. And second off, they're really valuable because these are the people that bring the bags of money back to the castle for you. So if you have to go find top salespeople and deploy them all across a massive geography, that's expensive. That's expensive. So the reseller network and performance-based sales, I mean, the most, this most simplistic version of it is just a good old affiliate sale. I mean, that's, that's the way you can think of some of that. So yeah, congrats. It sounds like you guys have figured a lot of this out. And I, I love that. I love your sales approach uh, because a, another thing, if you have a sales channel or a network of resellers and you can't adequately, these people finally get to the point where they think they're going to sell something and you don't have someone there to answer those couple questions that are going to get that money in the cash register, that will probably be the last time they push your product. Do, is that true? Yeah, yeah. And we've been yeah. there, done that, made mistakes, learned from those mistakes. And uh, but yeah, I think, uh, again, that guru support that we have is as helpful for our resellers as it is for our, uh, you know, end users. And that has been a big selling point for us. So do, is there is there a lot of competition in this space for you? So if you look at our individual products, right? Like, for example, you were talking about hype, one screen hype. I mean, you can say Zoom is a competitor that's, you know, uh, that we're using right now and Microsoft Teams and all those guys. But most of our competitors are siloed solution. They are only addressing a piece of the puzzle. The way we have built all of these different technologies from like attendance management to distance and blended learning to annotation and whiteboarding to, you know, classroom collaboration solution, um, content for K through 12 space um, and offering it as a bundled turnkey solution. Um, you know, today nobody else has such a comprehensive turnkey uh, offering for, um, you know, the schools. And that is really what differentiates us, right? So, so for every single product, a lot of competition, but when you look at our complete product portfolio and the solution we are selling, um, there's still really nobody out there who's, who's uh, you know, positioning the product the way we are doing it. Uh, there's something to be said about having all the pieces to the puzzle, man. Cause you know, I, I talked to, oh man, look at how many, how many things out hey, for those of you listening, how many things in your life are daisy chained together with one another. And you know, you've even seen platforms like Zapier that exist to do nothing but connect you to other things. Cause you know, it, it, one of the the platforms that uh, that I I built and full scale owns is gigabook.com and that's an online booking platform and and I got to say like 50% of the time when someone's asking us does it connect to this we're sitting there going not only does it not connect to it we've never heard of it 
because there's just so many things out there. And then the half of them are, are mainstream and it's, there's just a while, but that connectivity is key to everything now. Um, and this, you know, we're kind of late, kind of late in the discussion for this, but I'm a huge advocate of, of having amazing onboarding. How important is that with you guys? Like, like how, how much time and effort and refinement have you gone in to the getting not only a user, but a seller, but anybody like to a point where they are using your product quickly? Like how, how big of a, how big of an advocate are you behind uh, of that? So, so what we have learned is that it has to be an, an ongoing effort. It cannot be just a one-time onboarding for a product like ours. It's an ongoing long-term effort and we have to take the users step by step through, I guess, from being like a novice uh, user of the product to being, you know, a power user. And so what happens is as soon as we ship the products and it's getting installed, um, you know, we reach out to the schools and we provide unlimited free trainings up front uh, for using the product, which generally happens in two to three sessions where, you know, let's say if we have sold uh, the technology to a school, they will group teachers and maybe, you know, groups of 20 or 25, and we'll conduct uh, three training sessions for, for each of that group, right? So there's an initial training on the basic use, and then a couple of weeks later, we do a more advanced training. Um, so that is how we are kind of addressing the initial training piece and just getting them comfortable enough where they're not shying away from just walking up to the screen and starting to use it. But then from there onwards, I think that idea of we are there to train you whenever you need us is, is what's making us different because it's on an ongoing basis. Every day they're coming in, they're learning something new, they're following us, we're teaching some, something new. So the usage adaption with a technology like us, what we have learned is it's almost a one to sometimes two year cycle where a teacher really under, starts using at least 50% of the technology that, you know, we have offered to them, right? So, so it's an, I mean, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a long process, but that's really, um, that's really the sticking point as well, because once they have started using the product and, you know, they've been doing it for a year or two years, then we know that that teacher is, is loyal to one screen technology for a very long time. Yeah, I'm sure that's that, you know, if you can get someone understanding and knowing your product, like don't do not underestimate how valuable that is because people don't want to learn how to use something new. And that's the you, you hear that you hear the term sticky of a product is sticky. I mean, you know, and I've seen a, a, at one point I managed a chain of retail stores in the music industry and we had the worst point of sale system ever. And I called it out. I said, why do we use this? And this was a long time ago. This is like when you had to like hit F6, F7, tab, 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 and like control three. And there was no, there was no instructions. I said, well, why do we have this? This sucks. It's because the effort of go of training 1500 people to use something new grossly uh, was grossly more expensive than living with something that wasn't that great. And, and, you know, so if you can get, if you can get well entrenched in there, uh, you're in pretty good shape. Now, you guys have a whole lot of moving parts and a whole lot of different stuff, which means that a level of leadership has either had to be brought to the table or you've had to evolve into that over the years. What are a few things that you've learned that transformed you as a leader, a professional or a person throughout the the whole process of building one screen? I think the most important lesson was to to have a leadership team that's that's smarter than than me and they and empower them to make you know uh, the decision. So we have offices in seven countries now, and you know each one of those countries there's a you know there's there's a person leading that and and you know from my perspective I'm kind of more hands off now from day to day operations and really looking at the bigger picture you know. Uh, in terms of product roadmap and, and the vision for the company. But I'm just blessed with, with a, you know, really strong leadership team that's, that's uh, you know, uh, 
uh, running the day-to-day -day operations in different parts of the world very efficiently. Is there something that you do regularly to improve your success, your happiness, or perhaps your creativity? At a personal level? Yeah, just anything. I mean, I think that, that mm -hmm. you know, we actually, I, I just prior to recording this, I was on our weekly manager call where, um, and you know, in this, I've had a really good last month or two. And so much of that had to do with what, what you just talked about, having great support people and leadership and doing different things. Because the more that they can keep me away from doing certain things, the more of other things I'm able to do. You know, there's just a simple phrase, all you can do is all you can do. Um, for me, I'll give you an example. For me, I just, and I'm, I'm getting older, I'm, I'm 45 years old at this point, but I've learned to spot moments where creativity is flowing from me and I stay on top of that wave as long as I humanly can, because it is very difficult to know when the next one's coming back by. So in some cases, if I feel like I have that clarity or creativity, I might stay awake for two days until I can't handle it anymore because the things that are coming out of me and the things that are, you know, but if I don't, if I hadn't learned to recognize that I'd be missing out on some really great stuff. Is there, is there any signals or, or flares or anything that you've learned or, I think I can relate to some of what you are saying. I think, you know, in my case, I have, uh, you know, two boys, twins, nine year old. And so every evening going back to them, spending the evening uh, with them, like playing like a child, gets me the energy to get back, you know, next morning and, and have, I guess, the energy once again to, um, to, you know, go back to work and uh, be at my full creativity and productivity. But it's for, typically for me, it's it's the what I found is it's the early hours of the day, uh, which are always more productive for me. So I try to you know uh, maximize uh, those, and uh, and not getting bogged down with the details helps me a lot. Again, I mean, you know, the the leadership team that we have in place has been with me since 2012. We, we you know, none of those people have left. So that really uh, allows me to not worry about the day-to-day -day, uh, challenges and, and focus more on, uh, you know, uh, on being more creative and, and you know, uh, focus on the big, big, big vision, big picture for the company. I would, I would imagine your early mornings are kind of like my late nights. The, the world is calmer. Uh, notifications aren't going off. Phones aren't ringing. Employees aren't asking a bunch of questions and stuff like that. For me, I do, I do some of my best work from 9 p.m. till 3 a.m. Um, and that's just because the world quiets down. So once again with us today, Sufjan Manir, the CEO and founder of OneScreen. Scroll down and click the link in the show notes to learn more about what they do. Uh, before we get into, you know, we, we end episodes of Startup Hustle with what we call the Founders Freestyle. So I'll buy you some time here to think about your parting comments and advice that you'd like to give to startup founders that want to follow in your path. And while I buy you time to, to think of what you want to say, I will once again remind everyone that today's episode of Startup Hustle has been brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. So... In closing, and by the way, thank you for taking time. This has been I, I this has been great. I really love what you guys do, and I think you've said some really amazing and valuable stuff, regardless of what industry you want your startup or entrepreneurial venture to go. There's been a lot of really, really valuable stuff that Sofian has shared with us today. But on the way out, is there is there some advice that you can give to startup founders that want to find some success like you have? I guess all I can say is, um, you know, it's this is not an easy path, right? Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, there will be a lot of challenges. But if you aim high and if you believe in your vision and if you have the right team behind you, don't give up easily, right? Doesn't, doesn't matter what happens on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, keep marching forward, and and good things will happen. They'll they'll you know come from, from places that you least expect. Um, but having that persistency and a and a strong team with you is is what's going to make or break you. 
Yeah, and it, yeah, I'm going to parlay off that. I think that that's everything. Now, it, early it, for those that don't have experience with that, it's sometimes easy to want to be cheap or not value like having the best people around you. And it, and maybe you just have to figure that out on your own. But if you can just take everyone's word for it and try to find the best people possible. And with that, you know, hiring them is difficult. I have found that the best people that I wor- have ever worked around, they were good right away. And um, they're not projects. They're not, you don't have to re- reclaim them from the rest of the world. Like they come in, and they come in hot and they, and you know, right away, you're like, I've got the, I've got someone here that's good. Um, now in the words of, of my friend, Cameron Harold, and go back and listen to the CEO whisperer, you have three classes of employees. You have racehorses, workhorses, and those that are meant for the glue factory. So, you know, and, and I, that's a, it sounds like a very impersonal way to look at stuff, but it, you know, ever since Cameron said that to me, and this is someone that has been a support person and a coach for Marcelo Claire, the, you know, the CEO of Sprint and now the guy that's fixing WeWork, it's true. Um, so it, you know, if you look at your own business and you think like, you know, am I surrounded by racehorses or glue factory horses, um, you're probably, the answer to that is probably going to have a lot to do with how you describe how your business is working out or will work out. Um, have you found that to be true with, with great employees that they're usually great right away? Absolutely true. I think, I think you're, yeah. I mean, I I have, I have yet to prove that wrong. And I I have uh, just under 200 employees right now and have had several, I mean, a whole lot in the past. So, but yeah. And then, and then, you you know, they, you've, if you've ever read any or even a portion of a self-help book, it says you're only going to be as great as those that you're around a lot. So keep that in mind. And there's a reason why, while some people find success over and over and over, it's because successful people do the things that successful people do. So figure out what that is. There's a lot of great episodes you can go back. And this was a really good one. So I really appreciate your time and I appreciate everything you're doing. And, and, and really, uh, I do want to thank you once again for your time. So I'm going to get out of here, man. I gotta, I gotta go learn a bunch of stuff and figure out if my kid's school is using one screen. There you go. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. See you next me. time.